Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Happy Friday. Uh, before I take your questions, I have uh, something at the top here. As I think some of you or most of you saw, on Thursday, May 29, President Obama will host a summit at the White House on youth sports safety and concussions, where he will be joined by stakeholders including young athletes, parents, coaches, experts, professional athletes, and military service members. At the White House Healthy Kids and Safe Sports Concussion Summit, the President will announce new commitments by both the public and private sectors to raise awareness about how to identify, treat, and prevent concussions and conduct additional research in the field of sports-related concussions that will help us better address these uh, problems. As a, both uh, a parent and an avid sports fan, the President appreciates the role that sports play in the lives of young people, and his administration is committed to helping ensure that children continue to be active uh, and play sports safely. And now I'll go to your questions. Jim. Uh, thanks, Jay. Uh, on immigration, uh, Valerie Jarrett is quoted in Las Vegas as saying that there's a window between now and August to get immigration overhaul done, and she says, quote, we have a commitment from Speaker Boehner, who's very frustrated with his caucus. Now, the Speaker's office has denied that there's a commitment. And in a tweet today, uh, Valerie herself said that this was lost in translation and that she actually meant that it was a commitment to trying. But I guess the question is, a commitment to trying what and when? Speaker Boehner, other House Republican leaders, and leading Republicans outside of the House of Representatives have all expressed uh, deep interest in moving forward on immigration reform. And we have found those comments and that interest to be encouraging and indicative of some movement among Republicans in the House uh, towards support for comprehensive immigration reform. What the President has said and others have said uh, is that the opportunity before us is something very rare uh, and we ought to seize it here in Washington, all of us. The House ought to follow the Senate's lead and uh, pass comprehensive immigration reform. In the Senate, a comprehensive bill passed with Democratic and Republican support. Republicans across the country, business leaders across the country, faith leaders and law enforcement, enforcement leaders across the country are behind this effort. They recognize that passing comp comprehensive immigration reform will uh, provide a huge boost to our economy, to our security, to principles of fairness. Uh, and uh, for those reasons, we ought to move forward. And uh, what we hope is that the House will move. And that's a message that Valerie was carrying and that we have all been carrying for some time. Is, is the suggestion here that if it doesn't happen by August or at the end of August, like we have an August recess, but, um, that the President will take matters into his own hands. He has some authority to do some things, but would he do something beyond just tweaking the margins? But Well, I'm not going to speculate about the future. What we have always said will always remain true, which is uh, comprehensive immigration reform requires action by Congress. The President is always interested in uh, moving the ball forward on his agenda where he can, even if Congress refuses to act. Uh, but there are some things that require congressional action, and this is one of them. So the Senate acted in this Congress and has put a bill forward that enjoys broad bipartisan support across the country in communities uh, and among interest groups uh, that don't often get together behind the same priority. And we hope that Speaker Boehner Majority Leader Cantor, uh, Chairman Ryan, and others uh, hear all the voices of support, including traditional Republican voices, traditional conservative voices, uh, for comprehensive immigration reform and move forward with it. Uh, that's what uh, Valerie was talking about. That's what the President has talked about and I have talked about and others. Uh, we should get this done for our economy. We should get this done for our security. We should get this done uh, because it will allow us to uh, innovate uh, more here in this country in ways that uh, will build our economy and create high-paying jobs in this country. So uh, you know, the opportunity is there for the taking, and we hope that uh, the Speaker and other 
Republican leaders in the House avail themselves of the opportunity. Quick question on Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, reports today of uh, pro-Russian insurgents pulling out of buildings, government buildings in the city of Mariupol. Um, and this is because steel workers employed by one of the wealthiest men in Ukraine are uh, patrolling the streets with police officers. I'm wondering if that is that a welcome development at the, at the White House, or is there a concern that the government in Kiev is relying on oligarchs to essentially run the government in these in these tense regions? Well, I'm not sure that's how I would interpret the story that you're referring to. We certainly welcome any indication that separatists who are, have seized buildings, uh, who have set up roadblocks, stockpiled weapons, uh, are vacating buildings and, and ceasing the kinds of activities that have only uh, destabilized the situation in Ukraine and uh, led to confrontations and violence. So that would certainly be a good development. And the fact that significant portions of the population in Ukraine, including in eastern Ukraine, uh, do not support the agenda of Russian-backed separatists, uh, but support a united Ukraine and support a process by which decisions around constitutional reform and devolution of power from the center are made in an appropriate way. That's a good thing. Uh, this. These are the kinds of issues that the Ukrainian government in Kiev uh, has promised will be discussed in uh, dialogue with Ukrainians from all parts of the country uh, at roundtables that are facilitated by the OSCE. Uh, that's a good thing. And all of this comes as we move closer now uh, to a presidential election on May 25. And, and our focus and the focus of the OSCE and the Ukrainian government and all of our partners in this effort is on ensuring that those elections are able to go forward. And the OSCE has reported that um, the preparations, the technical preparations for the elections are proceeding well. Separatists have disrupted preparations in some isolated areas uh, of uh, Donetsk and Luhansk. Uh, but uh, in the vast majority of the country, as you know, Jim, uh, the situation is calm and preparations are on track. And that's certainly a good thing and a welcome development. Jeff. Jay, uh, General Motors was assessed a 25, excuse me, $35 million fine today over its ignition switch uh, issues. Does the President believe that fine is enough? I haven't discussed it with him. I would refer you to, obviously, the uh, agency involved here, Department of Transportation and, and, and uh, National Highway uh, Safety and Traffic. Uh, NHTSA, however, you, whatever that <laughs> acronym <laughs> stands for. But they, uh, uh, they're the bodies that you should address questions about it to. Has he been following that issue? Well, he's certainly broadly been following it. Uh, it's, it's been a, an issue that's uh, received a lot of attention, understandably. But uh, in terms of that process, that's not something that uh, I, I would have a lot to say about. Two quick more policy questions. You've talked a lot about the issue with China and Vietnam and wanting that to be resolved in a way that is diplomatic and without provocation. Mm -hmm. Do you want China to move the oil tanker? Here's what I'd say about that, and I appreciate the question. Uh, first of all, we're closely following out of our mission to Vietnam uh, the protests in Vietnam around this issue. Uh, but regarding the broader issue of China's unilateral decision to introduce an oil rig accompanied by numerous government vessels for the first time in waters disputed with Vietnam, uh, we would say what we have said repeatedly, which is this is a, provoc this is a provocative act and it raises tensions in the reason, region uh, and by raising tensions makes it more difficult to uh, resolve claims over disputed territory in a manner that undermine, uh, that, that, that supports peace and stability in the region. Uh, so we consider that act provocative and we consider it one that uh, undermines the goal that we share, which is a peaceful resolution of these disputes uh, and uh, general stability in the region. We're very concerned about dangerous conduct and intimidation by government-controlled assets operating in this area, and we call on all parties to conduct themselves in a safe and professional manner, to preserve freedom of navigation and overflight, uh, 
to exercise restraint, uh, to take steps to lower tensions, and to address competing sovereignty claims peacefully and in accordance with international law. As you know, sovereignty over these islands, the Paracel Islands, is disputed. This is occurring in waters claimed by both Vietnam and China uh, near those islands. These events highlight the need for claimants to clarify their claims in accordance with international law and to reach agreement on appropriate behavior and activities in disputed areas. As I've said before, the United States does not take a position on these competing sovereignty claims, but we do take a position on the conduct of the claimants who must resolve their disputes peacefully, without intimidation, without coercion, and in accordance with international law. Thank you. And one last mm -hmm. more policy question. Do you have a reaction to the election in India? I do. Um, first of all, we congratulate uh, India and, and the people of uh, India on uh, an historic national election which saw more voters cast their ballots freely and fairly uh, than in any election in human history. We congratulate uh, Narendra Modi and the BJP on winning a majority of seats in this historic election. Once the government is formed, we look forward to working closely with the Prime Minister and the Cabinet to advance our strong bilateral relationship based on shared democratic values. Uh, we would also like to thank Prime Minister Singh for the role he played in transforming our strategic partnership, uh, partnership uh, during his 10 years in office. Can Moving around. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Narendra Modi was banned uh, the U.S. visa for the last 10 years. Uh, do you think that was a step which, was, which could not have been taken, was, it, was not a right step in the direction? I'm sorry, the question, I understand about yeah, the visa, but what's visa. the question? Do you think that that was the wrong step taken by the previous administration, or do you stand by that? Well, I would refer you to the State Department for general uh, answers to questions about the issuance of visas. I can tell you that the Prime Minister of India will be welcomed to the United States. Uh, and I would also note that U.S. officials, including Ambassador Powell, have met with Mr. Modi, so he is certainly not unknown to us. And does the President have any plans to call him? The President does plan to reach out uh, to Mr. Modi, and I'm sure we'll let you know when that's happened. Just yeah, go ahead. Uh, one, uh, um, if the uh, uh, President is preparing to invite, uh, uh, to be the Prime Minister Narendra Modi to the White House, and second, if you can confirm if the President has received a farewell letter from outgoing Prime Minister Manmohan Singh, Dr. Manmohan Singh. I don't have anything on any correspondence the President may have received, uh, and I think it's a little early to talk about uh, a visit. The President will be reaching out to Mr. Modi, and, and as I noted, we congratulate uh, him and the BJP uh, on winning a majority of seats in these historic elections. Uh, so uh, again, we, this is an important relationship, a, a, a strong uh, bilateral partnership, and the President looks forward to building on the progress we've made uh, with Prime Minister Singh. Uh, in our relationship, in our bilateral <coughs> relationship uh, with the next Prime Minister. And finally, uh, uh, entire uh, President's administration, all these eight years, uh, Mr. Modi was banned coming to the U.S. because there were several occasions when he was going to attend several functions in the U.S. Uh, you think it's a bitterness there between the two countries because of this, and now there is a landslide victory by the BJP and Mr. Narendra Modi and the sweep out the outgoing government. What is the future of the U.S.-India relations? I think the future is bright. Uh, we have long said that we look forward to working with uh, whomever the Indian, Indian people choose uh, in these elections. And the U.S.-India partnership enjoys broad support across party lines in both of our countries. And I am confident that we will continue our successful and productive partnership uh, with the new Indian government. The President looks forward to speaking uh, with Mr. Modi and to working with uh, the new government once it's formed. Let me move on. I think you've had a follow-up on that. Okay. Let, me get, let me get to you. We'll, we'll, I promise I'll get to you, to Henry. John. Hey, Jay, a follow-up on the immigration question. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering where the White House stands now on the issue and what is acceptable, what is not. Is it essential still to the White House that whatever finally emerges from Congress include a path to citizenship? That's the President's position. It is uh, uh, elemental to the principles that he put forward. It is reflected in the bipartisan bill that passed the Senate. Uh, and uh, the President strongly believes that it needs to be a part of comprehensive immigration reform. We have long said that 
the House would uh, necessarily uh, pursue its own path in uh, the construction of an immigration reform package, but comprehensive immigration reform is essential uh, because the, the whole works together uh, in a way that uh, achieves all of the important benefits uh, to the economy and to the country uh, that we are looking for uh, with the passage of this legislation. So uh, I'm not going to get into a lot of parsing of what ifs because we haven't seen a thing out of the House right. yet. And we're looking forward to the House acting on uh, the urges we've heard expressed and the interests and desire that we've heard expressed by Republicans, uh, including Republican leaders on this matter. So and we want to see uh, we want to see comprehensive immigration reform. We want to see comprehensive immigration reform that meets the test set uh, by the president when he laid out his principles a number of years ago. And those principles are reflected in the Senate bill, as I've said uh, many times. That bill is not exactly, uh, does not exactly mirror what the President would have written if he were to write a bill and see it pass through Congress. And he doesn't expect that what emerges from the House, if the House has the courage to act on this, uh, to uh, match word for word what he would uh, prefer. But what he does insist is that comprehensive immigration reform adhere to the principles he laid out in the beginning. So, so whatever the legislative process, not parsing that, the final bill that he would sign into law must include a path to citizenship. I just want to be that. We said all along that. that comprehensive immigration reform needs to uh, include a path to citizenship. And he will not sign a law that is short yeah, of that. Well, I mean, I, that's, that's not, not sign a law. I mean, but there's just so many different. Uh, but he, he, whatever bill, if he will not sign a bill. Uh, that does not include a path to citizenship. Uh, that's my question. He signs a lot of bills that don't include paths to citizenship. Uh, you know what I, mean. <laughs> <laughs> I know what so, you so, mean so, too. So, but so, so, what I'm not so going to so do is, is is. So he's open to signing a, an immigration bill that is, is falls short of a path to citizenship. Is, is that his, still his position, uh, unlike the position of others, has been absolutely consistent from beginning to end, uh, or to this point. Unfortunately, we're not at the end yet, uh, and I don't expect it to change. Okay, and then uh, on the uh, VA, um, I I've heard you and I've heard others at the White House uh, talk about the VA as having a good record on dealing with the backlog of claims and mm -hmm. actually praising the VA on this issue. In light of the way this, as we learn more about problems not just in the Arizona office but in, but, but in other uh, parts of the country, are you still saying that you think that the, v the Veterans Administration has done a good job in dealing with the backlog of claims. I mean, are you still going to say that? I, no, I appreciate the question, John, and I think it's important to note, and I tried to the other day when this came up, you're, you're conflating two separate things. The disability claims, the backlog in disability claims is a specific problem and challenge uh, that the VA and, and the White House and others in the administration have been aggressively attacking. And that is where you have seen a 50 percent reduction in the size of the back backlog uh, year over year from this point to a year ago. Uh, and that has been important progress. And the, uh, the size of that backlog increased significantly when uh, this administration, uh, because our veterans deserve it, made the decision uh, that there would be a presumption of uh, acceptance of a claim if you were a veteran uh, claiming problems associated with exposure to Agent Orange. That's a, the first time that's ever been done. That's what this administration did. If you were a veteran of uh, the first Gulf War and you felt that you were uh, a victim of problems associated with exposure uh, into that, in that war. And, and if you were a victim, were you a veteran of uh, Iraq or Afghanistan and you experienced post-traumatic stress disorder, again, your claim would uh, clear a hurdle automatically under this process that we established in this administration uh, because we believe our veterans deserve it. That immediately increased the population of people who had disability claims added to the backlog, and that backlog has been a focus of uh, intense work and attention by the VA and the administration in general. On the matter of uh, the absolute uh, requirement that our veterans get the health care and services that they deserve, and they do, uh, they get that in a timely fashion, uh, the revelations or at least the allegations that have emerged from uh, the situation in Phoenix, uh, I think have uh, 
been greeted in terms of reaction uh, in the manner that Secretary Shinseki uh, suggested yesterday with a great deal of uh, anger and frustration. And if they prove to be true, uh, people will be held accountable. Uh, but these are, this is, these are matters and, and other issues that have been uh, uh, discussed in the wake of those allegations that are properly under review at the order of Secretary Shinseki, uh, under investigation at the uh, recommendation of Secretary Shinseki by the Independent Inspector General. Uh, and uh, as you know, the President and Chief of Staff here have uh, uh, responded to Secretary Shinseki's recommendation uh, by sending one of the President's most trusted aides over to VA to help with that review, to work with Secretary Shinseki uh, on that review. So I think that reflects the uh, seriousness with which we approach this matter, our concern about uh, some of the allegations that have been made. But I just wanted to make sure that it was understood uh, that there is a the disability claims issue uh, is uh, not the same issue that is being discussed when we talk about the allegations in Phoenix. I think part of the confusion is when you and others have been asked about the problems in terms of veterans getting the health care that they need and deserve, you've answered with talking points on the disability claims backlog. So are you really, I mean, are you suggesting that this is a problem that is limited to the, the Phoenix office? I, I think that there are there is an active review uh, and uh, as well as an investigation by the IG that will determine both the what happened in Phoenix and I'm sure uh, what happened elsewhere if if some of the other allegations that we've seen uh, merit investigation. What I've been saying is that under Secretary Shinseki's leadership there has been uh, a firm dedication to providing the kind of services that our veterans deserve. It's reflected in some of the decisions that were made to uh, increase access to uh, disability claims and to health care. Uh, we have, under his leadership, reduced veterans' homelessness by 24 uh, percent. We've provided post-9-11 uh, GI Bill educational uh, benefits to more than one million students. Uh, and we have decreased the disability claims. My point is that when, when I talk about the progress that has been made, uh, I, I, I have been referring to uh, questions about Secretary Shinseki and his leadership of the Veterans Affair uh, affairs uh, Department, and uh, the, that progress has come on his watch, and he certainly deserves credit for it. Do, do, do you think it sounds strange that, we, given the evidence that we're seeing coming out, the suggestions that veterans have actually died waiting to get? Uh, I think you, the, you, the word you use is essential because you said the suggestion. And this matter is in, under investigation. I would point you to what but, the but IG you said yesterday. But you are praising the VA for for all the things that have done under, uh, you know, been done under Shinseki's leadership. Uh, it just, it just, it, 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 there so let me let me just. The, explain what, the way you just asked that question. You're saying there's a suggestion that something terrible happened in Phoenix, and that's under investigation. All we know is that it's so a suggestion. So you don't think there's evidence that there's been a real problem with the, with the quality uh, of health care that our veterans are I getting? Think you, 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 don't, you don't think that this is going to be, we still need to study this further. You're not, you don't think there's enough to act on right now to say that our veterans aren't getting the care that they we need? We are acting on the allegations and the suggestions that you suggest that you pointed out and I would point you to what the IG said yesterday about his ongoing investigation into that you investigate more uh, you're saying we shouldn't we should just uh, accept allegations as true without investigating them I don't think that would be a normal procedure meanwhile we are uh, moving aggressively uh, in, in a host of areas to ensure that our veterans are getting the uh, the services and the care that they deserve uh, and that's reflected not least in the fact that the President has uh, requested increases in the budget for the VA every year he's been in office uh, in a time of very tight budgets. And uh, he has uh, insisted, uh, when it came to the serious matter of the disability backlog, uh, that we uh, attack that problem with uh, aggression and with uh, substantial resources, and that's resulted in the, in the uh, reduction in the backlog. And that reduction needs to be eliminated. I mean, the, the, the backlog has been reduced, but it needs to be eliminated. And that's a, an important part of making sure that our veterans are being taken care of. Let me move around a little bit. John. To, to follow up on what John was asking, if General Shinseki is mad as hell about what went on, why is it the White House position that it's just allegations and suggestions? It seems to me he's made a conclusion in his mind that something, something bad happened. I think I would refer you to his testimony. The, the fact is, if what has been alleged is true, uh, that would be an outrage. And that is an opinion shared by the President, by Secretary Shinseki, and uh, I think everyone else who's looked at this matter and works on these issues. Why is he uh, but for the President was asked about the 
allegations and answered forthrightly and expressed his concern about it. The actions that we've taken uh, reflect the concern that we have about it. Uh, and the fact that he's uh, sent one of his most trusted and top aides from the White House over to the VA to assist the Secretary uh, in his review uh, reflects the seriousness with which we take this matter. Uh, but again, I would simply say that it stands to reason that once, when allegations are made, it's important to be that they are investigated to find out uh, the truth behind the matter before we uh, uh, just assume that what happened or what's said to have happened is true. Uh, I'm not in any way prejudging because I don't think we ought to prejudge. I do think that it's a matter of enough concern that the actions that Secretary, Shin Secretary Shinseki has taken and the actions that uh, the President and the White House have taken are merited uh, and uh, will continue to aggressively tackle this problem. Should the, should the American people sure. be able to Sorry. trust that the President says he's, uh, you said the President's sending over one of his most trusted aides to oversee this. Wasn't General Shinseki one of his most trusted aides? Why should the American public look at that and say, well, that's the right thing to do instead of bringing somebody in from the outside, perhaps, to look at what, what's going on at the VA? John, what I can tell you is uh, the President uh, has confidence in Secretary Shinseki, uh, someone with an uh, incredibly admirable record in the military uh, and uh, in service to our veterans. And again, under Se Secretary Shinseki, there has been significant progress. There remains a, a lot of work to do when it comes to making sure that our veterans get the services and care that they deserve. Uh, but uh, Secretary Shinseki is aggressively uh, uh, tackling the challenges that uh, we face on these matters. And when we've seen, when we see revelations like or accusations like what we've seen uh, with regards to the office in Phoenix, uh, it was certainly our view when Secretary Shinseki suggested it to our chief of staff uh, that we, uh, that it was the right thing to do to add capacity, if you will. Uh, in order to make uh, the effort more intense and, and, uh, and uh, more rapid uh, to Secretary Shinseki's team by sending Rob Neighbors over to the VA. Yeah. Jay, um, on that point about the President speaking out, today for the second time this week alone he talked about transportation funding, infrastructure uh, funding because it's a priority for him. If fixing this VA problem is a priority for him, why have we not heard from him since April 28th? A lot has happened since he spoke out at that news conference. Right, a lot has happened. The, there have been allegations. The Veterans Affairs Administration has responded to those allegations by uh, launching a review and uh, suggesting and recommending and soliciting that the independent IG investigate. The President has asked his Deputy Chief of Staff for policy, one of his most trusted advisors, to temporarily uh, take a, an assignment over at the VA to assist Secretary Shinseki in that effort. Uh, and uh, Secretary Shinseki, as you know, was testifying on Capitol Hill just yesterday about this. Uh, this is something that, again, the President uh, cares deeply about when it comes to uh, our veterans and ensuring that we provide for them in, in a way that honors the service so they provided us. Why is speaking directly to veterans on this and saying, this is how much it matters to <coughs> we're going to fix it. Your words are important, but if you're, you know, on transportation funding, for example, he doesn't just have you do it, he gets out there and says, we, Congress has to move on this. Why is he not out directing veterans? Well, again, he's taking action, uh, Ed. He has, he has responded to this. He has spoken about it. I'm sure there'll be an opportunity for him to speak about it again. Uh, I think you would be the first to say that if, uh, and maybe you would, since Congress isn't acting yet on uh, transportation, that speaking alone uh, does not get the job done. Acting gets the job done when it comes to transportation. Sure, when, it com when it comes to transportation he funding, he doesn't give up if I may, Congress Ed, if when it comes to transportation funding, uh, that requires action by Congress. So to ensure that hundreds of thousands of Americans aren't thrown off the job uh, come uh, August. Uh, when it comes to uh, taking the actions that we've taken as an administration in response to allegations, uh, that's something we can do and that's something that the President has directed. I react directly to House Majority Leader Eric Cantor. He put out a statement yesterday saying he believes there's a pattern at the White House where the cabinet secretaries take all the heat and the president ultimately is just not held accountable. Well, uh, I would say that this briefing doctor. suggests otherwise. I would suggest, I would it's say true. that, it's not the president. well, a briefing is not. The, the point is that I think the, in the time that this, that this the, 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 since those allegations uh, emerge in the press, the president's given four or five press conferences. So I think he's uh, had the opportunity and has been uh, to address this and has been asked about it. I think there'll be other opportunities for him to address this. But he, what he has also done is acted on it, uh, and so has Secretary Shinseki.
Last one is, um, you were talking about immigration earlier and that, that the clock is ticking and minimum wage, a lot of other important priorities that the president has been pushing, transportation funding as well. Mm -hmm. Is there any fear at all with Congress having hearings, the IGs having investigation? There was talk yesterday the FBI may get involved because there may be criminal charges in the, F, uh, in the VA scandal if, if in fact people did die because of this. My question being, is there any fear that this is a big, um, I, I struggle to use the word distraction because it's an important issue that veterans get their health care, but is it something that overshadows uh, the attention of Congress right now so you can't get immigration and other stuff done? I would simply say that it's an, an important matter and that the resources necessary to tackle it uh, so that we are providing the services and benefits that veterans deserve uh, are, are merited and, uh, and uh, the attention that is paid to it uh, by those who uh, are concerned about the problem as opposed to politics is absolutely appropriate. That's how the President views it. Bill. Does the uh, government have any confidence, this administration have any confidence that the Nigerians can ever retrieve the young women, particularly in light of today's news that President Jonathan was supposed to go to the village from which they were kidnapped and decided at the last minute not to go? Well, I would say that, first of all, a couple of things. There's no question that the Nigerian people, Nigerians, face a real threat in Boko Haram. Uh, Boko Haram has demonstrated it has no regard for human life, and it has demonstrated an increased ability to conduct attacks, uh, and those attacks have increased in frequency and lethality. So uh, this organization poses a serious threat in that country. When it comes to uh, the efforts uh, undertaken by the Nigerian government to find these girls, we've made clear that, in our view, time is of the essence, and uh, that uh, you know we can and are assisting the Nigerian government in the search, uh, but the Nigerian government has the lead and needs to uh, act ac accordingly. Now but we are. Seem to be making any progress. You mean the girls haven't been found? <laughs> I mean, I think what no, we, I think from the Nigeria are not encouraging. Well. I think a circumstance, I mean, I think that it was important, and I tried to do this when we first started talking about the assistance the United States was going to provide, uh, to understand that uh, despite the expertise we have, the uh, capacities we have, and the kind of uh, assets that we can bring to bear in this, that this is a, this is a tremendous challenge. Uh, we're talking about fewer than 300 people who uh, are being searched for in an area at least the size of West Virginia. and. Uh, portions of which are very densely forested, as I understand it. Uh, so this is a, a difficult challenge. And, and again, that this is a population of kidnapped girls that uh, we hope remains intact and together. But obviously, if they have been separated, that makes the challenge even greater, uh, which doesn't mean that uh, we won't provide all the assistance uh, and uh, assets that we can in that effort in helping Nigeria uh, conduct this search. Uh, but it is certainly a challenge. Yeah, but the security situation is apparently so bad that the president of the country canceled a visit to the area today. Is that a question? I think the <coughs> fact that the, the security situation, uh, because of Boko Haram, is, uh, is real is one that uh, is self-evident, and which I discussed uh, moments ago. But that doesn't mean that we can't, and that they can't, conduct a search, uh, and that's certainly what's happening. We've already, as I discussed earlier this week, uh, launched both man, manned and unmanned uh, aircraft uh, as part of the reconnaissance effort, and we have a team of personnel assisting the Nigerian government in a variety of ways. Uh, other nations have uh, lended their support to the effort, and we uh, hope that it will bear fruit and we will find the girls. Chris. Jay, has President Obama spoken to uh, President Goodluck Jonathan, or does he plan to? Uh, I don't have any conversations to read out. Did he have a reaction to him canceling his trip? I haven't spoken to him about it. And uh, you, Nigerian officials, U.S. officials, officials from Britain and France are going to meet over the weekend um, and discuss their strategy moving forward. What is the anticipation on the part of this White House about the tangibles that might come out of that meeting, or those series of meetings? I think that we are focused on uh, assisting the Nigerians in uh, developing a concrete plan and a concrete approach to finding out where the girls are and uh, recovering them so that they can be returned to their families. And that uh, requires coordination and it requires strategy. Uh, and I assume that uh, 
uh, these conversations will be focused on that effort. And just going back to Bill's line of questioning, you have Alice Friend, who's the director uh, for African Affairs, talking about some of her frustrations, the frustrations of the part of the United States with the Nigerian government's, quote, slow to adapt uh, with new strategies and new tactics. Can you flesh out what some of the other frustrations are that the U.S. feels in terms of working with the government of Nigeria? Well, I, look, I think that the challenge that Nigeria faces uh, from this group uh, is a serious one. And, uh, you know, there are all sorts of issues that uh, she and others uh, have identified uh, that uh, make the challenge even greater that, uh, and that we uh, try to address as a, as a friend of Nigeria in the assistance that we provide. Um, that's why we provide security assistance to increase Nigeria's capacity to meet the threat, uh, including by helping professionalize its military and helping it carry out counterterrorism, uh, responsible uh, counterterrorism operations. It's why we provide law enforcement assistance to help Nigeria bring those responsible for attacks on civilians to justice. It's why we support programs and initiatives that are aimed at combating uh, violent extremist ideology, including by creating economic alternatives for those vulnerable to being recruited by terrorist organizations. So we have a coordinated effort uh, that is designed to help strengthen Nigeria's ability to respond uh, responsibly and effectively uh, to these challenges in a way that ensures civilians are protected and human rights are respected. And, you know, responding responsibly and effectively uh, is important because that's, uh, in, a, in effect, how you uh, provide uh, support for and reassurance to the population that is also having to deal with the threat posed by an organization like Boko Haram. And just one on Rob Neighbors. Is there a timeline for the review that he is conducting, as the President uh, said? I want you to for, the, for questions like that, uh, I would refer you to the VA. They're, they are obviously conducting the review. Uh, so I don't have a timeline on, on Rob's stay over at the VA, except to say that it is temporary, and he will be coming back and, and uh, returning uh, to his responsibilities as Def Deputy Chief of Staff here. Uh, when that uh, assignment is finished. Michelle. Uh, the White House has repeatedly expressed confidence in Shinseki's leadership, uh, progress under his watch. But the way that this all came out, even if you're going to keep calling them all allegations and they seem to be more widespread than one hospital, doesn't that in itself indicate a major shortfall in his oversight and leadership of the administration? Michelle, I I think I've addressed this question. What we have seen uh, in response to the allegations uh, that have been reported is uh, a review inst instigated by the Secretary, one that we are now providing a senior White House official to assist. The way it came out, that this was all, all of these problems that have been built up and widespread, it all came out through reporting by the press. That some of this wasn't even known about. So doesn't that in and of itself indicate a major shortfall there? Well, I'd say a couple of things about that. Uh, first of all, uh, there are active invest reviews and investigations into what happened. And I think, again, I'm not going to uh, pass judgment on what happened until we've seen uh, the conclusion of an investigation. And I think that's a generally a wise uh, approach to take. Uh, separately, uh, should some of these allegations prove to be true, uh, Secretary Shinseki has made clear that he uh, would be outraged by that and uh, angry by that. The President certainly would be. Uh, and he would expect uh, people to be held accountable. That's why there's an investigation. That's why there's a review. On the role of the press, I think the press in general, and I'm, again, I'm not going to pass judgment on whether or not the allegations are true because we don't know, but the role of the press is important in general as a uh, on matters uh, uh, like this and, and in so many other areas. So I wouldn't, you know, sell the press short when it comes to uh, the important role they play. Okay, and on Iran, um, these reports that come out this week that Iran is actively pursuing ballistic missiles, uh, well, what is the White House's view of that and the possibility of, of eventually reaching a nuclear deal? Well, on the, on the question of uh, ballistic missiles, we have made clear uh, that all issues of concern are on the table uh, during the P5 plus 1 negotiations uh, aimed at uh, reaching a comprehensive agreement. And we're not going to get 
uh, into details of specifics items of negotiations uh, because negotiating in public uh, wouldn't serve the goal here. Uh, but I would point you to the fact that the joint plan of action lays out very clearly the elements for a comprehensive agreement. Uh, and it talks about all concerns needing to be addressed. Uh, and it talks about making sure that we know that, in fact, this is an entirely peaceful program. It also talks about UN Security Council resolutions needing to be addressed, including provisions relating to ballistic missiles capable of delivering a nuclear warhead. So ballistic missiles fall into the uh, topics under discussion that would need to be part of a comprehensive uh, resolution of this uh, dispute and this challenge. So uh, that's the view we take without sort of teasing out any individual item and, and talking about what, how that concern would have to be addressed in a final product. Uh, you know, our, what we will do is point you to those UN Security Council resolu resolutions, the fact that the joint uh, plan of action explicitly calls for uh, those concerns to be resolved and uh, and make clear that everything in the JPA is on the table and has to be resolved for a comprehensive agreement to be reached. Thank you. Alexis. Jay, I have two questions. Um, on the Ukraine uh, elections, uh, a statement that uh, the Vice President put out uh, this week used the word delegitimize in the statement uh, that Russia would face additional costs should it disrupt or delegitimize the election mm -hmm. results. My um, question is a follow-up on a question I had earlier, which is, who who is the arbiter for the results of the election, whether they're disrupted or delegitimized, since sectoral sanctions would be so important to determine mm -hmm. and arrange? Who decides that? Well, first of all, there will be international observers organized by the OSCE who will uh, be able to make judgments about the conduct of the election and any efforts to undermine the election or delegitimize it. Uh, the United States and the, and the rest of our partners in the international community who have uh, taken uh, one side on this matter uh, and Russia, th which has taken another side, uh, I think, uh, you know, will make judgments about how the ele elections proceed. President Putin, back when he also said uh, or suggested that the so-called referenda should not be held on May 11th, also said that the May 25 election might be a good step, and we certainly agree with that, uh, and not just might be, but a necessary and important step uh, for the Ukrainian people. And uh, because it would successful uh, implementation of that election and would allow the Ukrainian people to freely express their will when it comes to choosing their leader, their president. And we are very focused on ensuring, with our partners, uh, that the election takes place. The, this is a small matter, but the president has a minor cold. I'm not suggesting he's ill, but, but here's the question. I can't find any public record that the president has had his full medical work up, his usual mm -hmm. exam, since before the election. And maybe I missed it. Can you tell us, update us when? I'll have to take the question. I haven't uh, looked into that. Okay. Zeke. Thanks, Jay. Uh, yesterday, the FCC voted uh, to uh, create uh, what's being called Internet Fast Lanes. Wondering, and the President, in, as he handed into that set in 2008, said he would have uh, opposed such efforts. Is the President disappointed by the FCC decision, or is he, you know, is he contemplating going back on his campaign promise from uh, six years ago? Well, the President has made clear since he was a candidate, Zeke, that he strongly supports net neutrality and an open Internet. As he has said, the Internet's incredible equality of data content and access to the consumer is what has powered extraordinary economic growth and made it possible for once tiny sites like eBay, eBay and Amazon to compete with brick and mortar uh, operations. The FCC is an independent agency, as you know, and we will carefully review their proposal. The FCC's efforts were dealt a real challenge by the Court of Appeals in January, but Chairman Wheeler has said his goal is to preserve an open Internet. And we are pleased to see that he is keeping all options on the table. Uh, we will be watching closely as the process moves forward in hopes that the final rule uh, stays true to the spirit of net neutrality. The President is looking at every way to protect a free and open Internet, and we will, uh, and he will consider any option that might make sense. Does the rule 
was passed yesterday meet the president's standards for net neutrality? Again, I think the rule uh, that what was passed yesterday was uh, something that kept options on the table, and that's what. Uh, uh, that's not yes or no. Though. Well, if you have all options on the table, then you know you, the president will be looking very closely to see that the outcome of this. Uh, uh, results in a final rule that stays true to his, uh, to the spirit of net neutrality, which he supports. Fred, and then Scott. All right. Thank you, Jeff. And then to Hinder. Uh, okay. I've got a couple questions. Um, first, uh, yesterday, uh, Secretary Johnson had said on the PBS News Hour that you might be looking at changes, um, or the President might be looking at changes to the Secure Communities Program as part of the reforming the deportation policy. Um, does White House have anything on that? that uh, I, I, I didn't see that uh, comment. What I think you know is that the President asked Secretary Johnson to address, uh, to, to review procedures uh, when it comes to enforcement. Uh, and that review is underway. I would refer you to the Department uh, for any status update they might have. And um, also this week, um, there were some documents released to Judicial Watch for the FOIA a lawsuit uh, that did appear that the Washington Office of the IRS did have more uh, uh, to do with targeting the, some of the Tea Party groups in this. Does that? Um, I, I didn't see that report, so okay. I don't have a response. Okay. Well, uh, do, do, does the White House still believe that this was entirely out of the Cincinnati office, as the White, as the President said during the Super Bowl? <coughs> Our position hasn't changed, and I certainly haven't seen any facts that suggest otherwise, but I haven't seen the report that you mentioned. Scott. I'm just curious about this sports concussion event. It'll be a public event discussion? Yes. And <coughs> what is the President hoping to get out of it? Will there be a, a <coughs> list of recommendations? A we, we hope uh, to see and expect to see some public and private uh, commitments made uh, towards the study uh, and uh, sort of study of and education about uh, this problem. I think uh, the President, as a father, uh, who also has on his staff others uh, who are parents, uh, uh, knows that this is a topic that a lot of uh, families are discussing right now. Uh, as more and more information is uh, provided about uh, the problems associated with concussions in sports, especially for uh, our young, and uh, we have uh, the ability here because it's the White House and because he's the President, to help uh, elevate this issue uh, and help draw attention to it and support for uh, efforts to make progress on it so that we can ensure that our, our kids are uh, being able to get all the benefits that come from participating in sports, uh, but are able to do so uh, in as safe as way as possible. Was Roger Goodell invited? Will he be attending? Uh, I don't have a list of attendees uh, at this time. Um, uh, let me just see if... What I can tell you is um, we aren't prepared to announce participants or commitments at this time, uh, but the President recognizes that raising awareness of and better protecting children and student athletes from concussions and better identifying and treating them uh, when they do occur requires a team approach. And professional sports leagues, including the NFL, are certainly vital members of that team. You know, so this is an effort that a lot of people can be involved in and should be involved in, and I don't, you know. This is something that is often talked about within the context of football. I have a son who's expressed some interest in playing uh, tackle football, so it's something that uh, I'm particularly interested in. But it doesn't limit itself just to football. Obviously, we've seen a lot of reports about uh, concussions in other sports, including soccer. Uh, so this is something that uh, I think a lot of families spend a lot of time worrying about and want to know as much as they can about uh, and want to be sure that they're taking all the precautions they can on behalf of their children, so their children can get uh, all the great experiences that come from participating in sports. And last question on this: uh, the uh, how does he prepare for an event like this? Is he is he reading books? There's been some good ones, League of Denial, Frontline, and some documentaries. I, I'm curious about how he prepares for. Uh, I, I I know that it's something that uh, he has addressed when asked uh, a, a couple of times in in interviews, where he's noted that if he had a son. Uh, he would have to think twice about uh, saying yes to having him play football. Uh, there have been, obviously, the report that came out last fall that helped spark this conversation. 
Uh, and there's a lot of research that's been done uh, uh, within uh, the government uh, and including uh, within the military on uh, some of these issues. So I don't have specific uh, reading lists, uh, but I know that it's a topic of conversation here, just like it is uh, around the country. Uh, to Hinder, yeah. I have, I have two follow-ups. The first one is with our ambassador already retired, as we say, and uh, expected to leave uh, Delhi during this month. <coughs> uh, who is going to be the top diplomat in Delhi, or you're sending somebody from here to start the dialogue? I don't have any personnel announcements to make. It's obviously a very important post, but uh, when the president has an announcement to make, he'll make it. But, uh, are you sending somebody from here, one, one of the diplomats, to start? Because uh, if you see the baggage of mm -hmm. nearly 10 years of visa denial, just a statement welcoming him uh, may not bring him here. So will the U.S. go beyond that? Uh, I mean, you would have to speak to him about his views on this matter. To, uh, first of all, I think we've made clear that uh, we congratulate the Indian people and uh, Mr. Modi and his party on their victory. Uh, we await the formation of a government, and we absolutely look forward uh, to continuing all the progress that we've made in our bilateral relationship and fully expect to be able to do so. But just looking at a you know, personal level, will it be a kind of a hiccup? And if we are do, ready to do something to address that on a personal level? Again, I don't – the Prime Minister of India will receive a visa to travel to the United States. Uh, we look forward to working with the new government and the new Prime Minister, and we congratulate Mr. Modi and his party on their victory. I don't uh, anticipate any uh, problem uh, in that regard. Uh, what we do anticipate is uh, moving forward with the new government and strengthening uh, a relationship that has already been strengthened. Uh, significantly over the past years uh, with Prime Minister Singh uh, at the helm in India. Thanks. Yeah. Emil. Uh, thank you. Jay, uh, do you have any result on President call today to President Gill, uh, I don't know, mine disaster? Uh, I, I don't have a readout uh, for you. Uh, when, uh, when we do, we'll get it to you. Thanks, Jay. Uh, Justin. Thanks, Jay. Um, earlier this week, Secretary Hagel said that he was open to a review of the military's ban on transgender service members, wondering if the President backed that review and whether or not he's had any conversations with the Defense Secretary about that issue. Well, the President speaks with uh, Secretary Hagel regularly, meets with him weekly. I don't have a readout on all those conversations, but I would certainly uh, point you to what Secretary Hagel said, and, and, and certainly we support his efforts in this area. And the President, I don't think, has ever spoken out on this issue before, does he think that that ban should eventually be lifted? I would simply, at this point, leave it to Secretary Hagel's comments. I haven't spoken to him directly about this issue, uh, but I, I would note what Secretary Hagel said and, and, and that we support him. Jessica? Does the White House agree with Chinese PLA General Fang, who said yesterday that the Asia rebalance strategy is emboldened Vietnam and its territorial dispute <coughs> with China in the South China Sea? No. I would simply say what I said earlier about uh, the need for uh, parties to these disputes to address them in a peaceful and diplomatic way in keeping with international norms and international law. Uh, I would know what I said about the uh, unilateral decision and provocative one when it came to the when it comes to the oil rig uh, and our calling on uh, all sides to restrain uh, refrain from uh, taking actions that uh, inflame tensions as opposed to actions that uh, calm the situation and allow for uh, peaceful dialogue about it and, and resolution uh, about the dispute. Week ahead. Uh, week ahead, Jim, you're right. Hey, before you give us the week ahead, can you, you got breaking news on your no. device? No, this is not breaking news. Can you give us the President's reflections as we approach the 60th anniversary of Brown versus Board of Education? He's obviously meeting with some of the family members of the plaintiffs today. And maybe tell us why that event's closed, too. Yes. Yeah. It's a private meeting that the President's having uh, with families. I would note that the First Lady will be speaking uh, publicly uh, about uh, the anniversary of this landmark Supreme Court decision this evening uh, in Topeka, Kansas. Uh, the President feels, uh, as I think so many people do around the country, that this decision was historic, that it enabled uh, 
millions of Americans to uh, get a better education. Uh, there was a good story this morning about uh, the First Lady and, and how that decision affected her life, uh, which I think speaks to why it is so appropriate for her to be speaking on it uh, tonight. Uh, we have more work to do, and that's why the President has the aggressive uh, education agenda that he has. Uh, that's why he is focused on uh, making uh, pre-kindergarten uh, education available to all uh, in this country because that early start is so essential uh, for a child's future. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think that we've come a long way in 60 years, and this is uh, you know, an important anniversary to note. Uh, but uh, the President's views are uh, that that is true and that also we need to keep moving forward when it comes to uh, ensuring that we're doing everything we can uh, to provide a quality education to all of our kids. Let me give you the week ahead. On Monday, the President will have lunch with combatant com commanders. Uh, in the evening, the President will attend a DCCC event. On Tuesday, the President will attend meetings here at the White House. On Wednesday, the President will participate in an ambassador credentialing ceremony in the Oval Office. Uh, at this event, the President will receive the credentials from foreign ambassadors re recently posted in Washington. The presentation of credentials is a traditional ceremony that marks the formal beginning of an ambassador's service here. Afterward, the President will welcome the Su Super Bowl champion Seattle Seahawks to the White House to honor the team and their Super Bowl victory. On Thursday, the President will travel to Chicago to participate in two events for the DSCC. The President will remain in Chicago overnight. On Friday, he will return to Washington from Chicago. And I would be remiss in noting, in not noting, as I leave here, that today is uh, Kathy Rumley's last day, and we at the White House will all miss her uh, uh, wisdom and good humor, and we wish her well. Thanks, everybody.